so first of all, everybody, thank you so much for coming. Um, I think most of you already know me. My name is Hillel. I am mostly known for my work in formal methods and history. I'm not talking about either of those today. Instead, I want to talk about a question that's been bothering me for a couple of years about, is software engineering really engineering? Now, this is a rough draft. In fact, it's an incredibly rough, rough draft because on Thursday morning, I realized that my first draft, which was much more bio and brimstone in my normal way of speaking, wasn't actually a great way of presenting information. So I threw out everything and started over. That means that everything you're going to see is now extremely rough and is going to be a lot more conversational, but I think overall it works much better for the format. Other thing worth noting is that there's currently about 75 people I see in the channel, including a lot of people I respect, a lot of friends, a lot of Twitter friends, and at least two people that I interviewed. So I'm kind of terrified right now, but it should all be okay. So to start, here's a question that I think a lot of people have asked. How is software engineering different from civil engineering? And this is a question that we've been grappling with for like 50 years now. We've been grappling in conferences on slides in our work, on Hacker News, people always have hot takes about this. And generally I've noticed that the people's thoughts come into two categories. The first is the camp that says that software engineering is inferior to civil engineering, et cetera, and it doesn't actually like make sense to call ourselves engineers. Interestingly enough, this often comes from people who are outside, people looking in on software engineering, as well as a lot of people internal. The other view is what I like to sort of call the yay, we're special view, the special snowflake view, in this case propounded by, what's the guy's name? Atwood, the guy who did Stack Overflow on his blog, saying that bridge building is nothing like software development. It would be like software development if we built a bridge on the planet Jupiter out of newly invented materials using construction equipment that didn't exist five years ago. Now, this got me kind of interested because I am a huge contrarian and just love tearing down people's assumptions. And then two things in particular got me interested in this topic in particular. The first is this tweet by my friend Dan Liu. This was about two, three years ago now. And he said the following. He used to be an electrical engineer. He worked for Centaur as a hardware chip designer and then started working for um, Google and Microsoft and Twitter on performance for their like deep um, cloud stacks. And he made this comment that, by the way, electrical engineering isn't fundamentally different from software engineering, and some things are better and some things are worse. And this is interesting, because this was the first time I ever saw somebody who did both, and his take was different from everybody else's take. And the other thing that really inspired me to dig a bit deeper is this book by Nancy Levison, Engineering a Safer World. Now, Nancy Levison is a huge, huge influence of mine, and I really respect a lot of the work she does. And I found something interesting in the book. She went from software, from aerospace engineering to software, first doing safety in aerospace and that, like on airplanes and space shuttles, and then moving to making sure that software systems are correct. And she said the difference was physical geometry. There are physical, if you basically have, say, a keyboard and you try to put in like a new button to do something, you're going to have to put in all the circuits and the physical presence and the button on the surface, and that's going to conflict with everything else. Software doesn't have to deal with that. We can put as much complexity as we want into the same frame. And that is the form of a lot of the differences. Now, the reason I found these two interesting was that they were the first two things I read that were by people who had firsthand experience doing both software engineering and some other form. And their takes were much different from, say, again, Jeff Atwood's, who only has done software engineering and thinks that the difference is that civil engineering, it would be like building on Jupiter with out of new, you see what I'm saying here, right? Like there's a much big difference from people with firsthand experience. And that got me thinking that like, I don't think anybody who's really talked on the subject has ever worked on a bridge, at least not the people talking publicly about it. It would be like, you know how people say, oh, you do software, can you fix my computer? I think it has the upside down virus. They don't get that there's a difference between software development and their stereotypes of software development because they've never worked on it themselves. We were sort of doing the same thing when we talk about engineering. We all have this stereotype of what engineering looks like, but we don't have firsthand experience. We don't know what it's actually like. And we're basically then just spouting nonsense, right? 
So I wanted to fix that. I wanted to talk to people who were engineers. But not only that, I wanted to talk to people who were engineers in both software and another form. Because most of the engineers talking about software haven't done software either. They don't know what it's like for them to do, for us to do that kind of work. They're going to make the same misconceptions about us that we'd make about them. This meant talking to hybrid engineers, people who worked as one kind and then switched to the other. And it's important that they have work experience because I'm sure a lot of you have been through CS programs and such. And when we study this in like school, it's very different from how we actually do it in person. So I wanted to make sure that the people who were talking about civil engineering and architecture and stuff worked as civil engineers and architects and stuff. Now, before we really get into the details of this, so basically I talked in a lot of different specialties. So including mechanical, electrical, people who have worked on missile subs, people who have built like incredibly complex chipsets, people whose work we see every day, like there's a lot of different kinds of engineering and I was sort of really excited to dive into all the similarities and differences. In the end, I talked to about 17 people on this, focusing primarily on three questions. First of all, are we really engineers or are we just calling ourselves that? Is software special? Like, is it true that the equivalent would be building a bridge on Jupiter out of materials that didn't exist five years ago? And what can we learn from each other as fields? Those are the questions and that's what I'm going to be answering for the rest of this talk. Um, any questions so far? No, good. So quick breakdown of things. I had a list of questions I asked everybody. Everything except for two interviews were done over Zoom and recorded which I then created transcripts of for my own review. About a quarter of them were, were electrical engineers. There were some mechanical, chemical, and civil. For the record, electrical engineers do circuits. Mechanical engineers essentially are what you sort of think about when you think about like sort of like machines and such. And chemical people design processes to make chemicals in mass. Civil engineers are the people who build the kinds of bridges and roads that we think about when we say, ah, software is like bridge building. And then others are people like oil and gas rigs, people who sort of worked on like database design and layout, sanitation engineers, one nuclear engineer, et cetera. So one thing I just wanna make clear is that these interviews are not public. I gave, I basically promised everybody I would not be putting the videos online. If you wanna get the videos, um, you should spend 12 hours interviewing people yourself. <laughs> so question one, are we really engineers? Well, what does it mean to be an engineer? When you see people sort of give arguments, they tend to sort of list things like being licensed. Engineers are licensed and have regulations. Software engineers don't. People who deal with like fixed constraints are super rigorous about what they do. Things that are high stakes where if you fail, people die. Unlike our, unlike the Facebook app where if it fails, just people get annoyed slightly, et cetera. And honestly, the being licensed part is probably, oh, can I do like a little laser pointer thingy? yes, is probably what's like most um, commonly brought up that like in Canada, you can't even call yourself an engineer without having a license and being certified, which is itself kind of complicated. I'm not going to get into, but there's kind of one problem with this argument. Licensure is a regulatory and political thing, not a fundamental thing. Like in the U.S., you have to be licensed to be the principal engineer that signs off on projects, but the people working under the principal engineer can call themselves engineers and don't have to be certified as long as somebody else is checking their work. In fact, one of the people I talked to was considered an engineer as what's called a drafts, I'm starting out as a drafts person who essentially does the like blueprint, blueprint layouts. And when he started, he was actually before college. He was just essentially working with embodied experience and tech experience. It was basically treated as a full engineer because he was good at what he did. He wasn't able to sign off on anything, but the people above him trusted his judgments and knew he did good work. And he was only certified as an engineer much later than that. And that was fine. Not only is this sort of dependent on country to country, but each country seems to point at another one about what it means to be an engineer. Like the people in the US were like, oh, it's not real engineering like Canada where they have like everybody has to be licensed. And then people in the UK were like, oh, we're not real engineers unlike the people in the US who are totally licensed. And I'm pretty sure I could find people who would be like, yeah, we're not real engineers like the UK who are totally licensed. It's, it's, it's entirely like a 
cons it's entirely a regulatory construct. It doesn't really get at the heart of what it means to do engineering. So if we can sort of get license, what do we sort of have left? We've got things like physical materials, dealing with constraints, new things, rigorous, high stakes. But like any of these things is enough to say sort of what an engineer really is, but all of these either include things that we don't want to call engineering or don't feel are comfortable or exclude things that we do. For example, dealing with physical materials, so do carpenters and electricians. Very, very important, respectable jobs, but we wouldn't call a person who does carpentry an engineer, would we? That implies that there's something else going on here. And high stakes isn't quite true either. It's true for a lot of civil engineering where if something collapses, people can get hurt, but like, can everybody see these headphones? Or like, yeah, I'm wearing headphones right now. They were designed probably by a mixture of mechanical and electrical engineers. And that's pretty low stakes. If they fail, like what? I just have some really crappy headphones. I mean, you, you could argue that they'd lose a lot of money because they'd have to do recalls and stuff, but like a lot of software also leads to people losing a whole lot of money. If Google goes down, people lose millions an hour like ad revenue. If Facebook has an issue, it can lead to like massacres in, in, in countries as it has. If Facebook has extra latency, they're going to lose a huge amount of money. So like clearly a lot of things that people do with software is also high stakes, even if not like directly, if this fails, somebody dies. In fact, I couldn't really find anything that defined what it meant to do engineering, except engineering is what engineers do. Essentially the term engineering is circular. What we call engineering is what engineers do, and we call them engineers because they do engineering. I know the slide, I just have the word Wittgenstein, who, who is a very influential philosopher who is like, yeah, everything that we do is it's kind of similar. What we call any job titles, what everybody else does in that category. I'm, I'm very simplifying his philosophy here, but essentially what it boils down to is that the only way to really know for engineers is to talk to people and ask them, are we really engineers? Do people see us as such? So I just asked all the hybrids point blank. Are we really engineers? And two were an unqualified no, the 15 others were a qualified yes. So congratulations, everybody. We're really engineers. <laughs> okay, it's a bit more complicated than that um, for a couple of reasons. One is that one of the major qualifications I saw from a lot of people was that engineering is based on the type of work you do. So like a person designing a website probably isn't engineering because they don't have that same kind of constraints or or like limitations while somebody who's designing say like cloud infrastructure is an engineer. And sort of my kind of nuanced convoluted take based on this is that there's a lot of people that we, a lot of software developers aren't doing engineering and aren't engineers, but the gulf between software development and software engineering is, is much lower than say between an electrician and an electrical engineer. And that brings up the other thing a lot of people brought up is that a lot of software is essentially blue collar development corresponding to what an electrician does versus what an electrical engineer does. And this is very important work and electricians are extremely skilled, but they're doing essentially different kinds of work with different kinds of goals. And the idea is that a lot of us, we could be doing software engineering if we chose to, but a lot of us are doing more electrician style work. We don't really have a word for this, I guess, besides software developer, but that's these days interchangeable with engineer. Now, this isn't a new idea. Um, Oh, I think I just see a flashing. Did somebody ask a question? Oh, I see that somebody wrote internet plumber. Yeah, basically. I, I used to call myself a code nurse, um, but stop because I, for reasons. But this is actually an idea that was pioneered, I think, in the early 1990s by a person named um, Pete McBreen when he wrote um, software craftsmanship. This sure. was an argument that we weren't so much engineers as crafters. Um, his argument was that engineering is very, very strict and rigorous and predictable and boring, while software is much more dynamic and artisanal and flowy and essentially special. So we're not really engineers, we're crafters. To which I respond, did he talk to any engineers, like, <laughs> at all? Which, which brings me to my next point. Okay, so we're engineers, great. Or at least we could be engineers if we feel like it, which I'll take. But is what we do special? Is it, sim is it actually that similar to like, how do I get rid of my laser point? There we go. Is it actually that similar to like designing a bridge on Jupiter 
in high winds using materials that haven't been invented yet. So, the most important conclusion I took away from all this, the most important conclusion I took from all these interviews, these 12 hours of interviews, don't do it. Just don't. Never cross a bridge <laughs> if you can help it. Just stay. Don't even go inside a building, okay? Just stay outside your entire life. It is safer that way. And for the record, the argument of like, yeah, people don't have to like move a bridge after it's built. That never happens. It totally does. It happens all the time. I've talked to at least two engineers who've had to move bridges within a month of building them. Like, yeah, it turns out that pretty much everything that we say is special about software is actually pretty widespread in like all the fields, everywhere. This entire idea of like unpredictability, creativity, all engineering is like that, it turns out. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is actually from a person who um, was responding to the question I had about, so um, is it true that engineering is more rigorous and sticks to a plan and software is like much more freeform? And his point was like, look, I work on oil rigs. One of the oil rigs we had, we need to put new equipment in it. This equipment was slightly too small for the floor, slightly too large for the floor. It was like just about four inches too small, too, too tall, so we couldn't fit it inside. And this was the second floor of a five floor story oil rig, so we couldn't exactly take off the roof. So instead what we did is we took out a six by six section of the ceiling and raised it up by a foot. And then we put that in, we put the equipment in, in that one spot. So now there is a one foot indentation on the ceiling floor above it, just enough to fit this piece of equipment. Yeah, so every field of engineering does clutches, basically just hacking stuff just to get it working. The joke being you can always add more ceiling brackets. Another engineer told me this story that like, yeah, you have some code running production. What does it do? I don't know. Check the config. You have a house. What is, how is it wired? I don't know. Just tear down the entire wall. Yeah, we're kind of actually like lucky that we can undo our clutches where everybody else has to live with them forever. Oh my crap, has it already been 20 minutes? Damn. This is a lot longer than I thought it would be. Um, and as it, in fact, actually the idea that like, bridges are like more rigorous and stable is actually a relatively recent phenomenon. This is a tweet I found and I really should read this like book, but apparently once a week, actually almost once a day, like a bridge would collapse in the 1800s. It's only once we actually sort of sat down and like forced regulatory requirements to make it stable that it actually became safe. And even then it's not sure. Um, so couple of things that I actually want to bring up in particular that um, arguments I've heard because they have interesting responses is this one called engineering does old things, software does new things. The idea that software is like inherently unpredictable and you're always doing completely new things every single time while engineering is basically doing the same thing over and over again. Um, yeah, so this was probably the only question I got where people would start laughing at me when I said, when I asked it. Um, one of the people in the audience actually made this pretty good tweet that I commented out because of anonymity that like, Oh yeah, so we're working on the contaminated um, soils dredging project. Three different federal agencies are trying to fight about who's in charge and the ch regulations change every single month. Um, another person in the audience actually, who I was talking about this was like, yeah, so um, every month we have to sort of work on electrical circuits, um, basically CPUs, he, did, he was testing CPUs. And he's like, yeah, so every, um, every month the fab, essentially the factory that would create the chips for us would come out with a would basically have completely new capabilities and we'd have to like always adjust our schedule around what they could do. So yeah, a lot of fields are unpredictable. That's why engineers are paid a lot of money to work in them. Probably the best example comes from the chemical engineers where, and I'm kind of paraphrasing this a bit, a lot of chemical engineering is basically taking a process that works at a small scale and scaling it up. Except that once you try to make it scaled up to twice the size where we're basically instead of making say like 10 grams, we're making 20 grams, you have to use completely new physics. You have to do things completely differently. And another 10 grams from 20 grams to 30 grams, it just explodes. Uh, yeah, basically all of engineering is about constantly dealing with unpredictability. Maybe not in the same ways that we deal with unpredictability, but definitely to the same magnitude. 
the other one that I actually found was really interesting that I want to talk about is this idea that sort of code is the design. It's an assumption I constantly hear about the difference where it's like, oh yeah, if you, with construction, you spend 10% designing and 90% constructing it. With software, you spend 90%, like 99% designing it and only 1% constructing it. Um, and this is actually interesting because it's probably the most conflicted answer I got from everybody as in everybody had a different take on it. Um, for example, one of the people I talked to who worked as a systems integration engineer at Boeing was pretty straightforward. He's like, yeah, code's the design, and that's one of the big differences between what I did and what I did and what I do now. Whereas one of the mechanical engineers was like, okay, well, sorry, let me actually start before. One of the electrical engineers was like, yeah, so um, actually it's untrue. We spend about 95% of our time designing, and then once we're done, we send it to the fab and have them basically just give us back the chips. And then we'll probably iterate based on that to sort of figure out what we want to do next, very agile-like. And then one person was like, yeah, so sure, the code is the design, but which design? Because it turns out that you're constantly doing different designs at different levels of the project. So is code the architectural overview? Is it the low-level design? Is it the territorial layout? Like, you have to clarify what you mean by the design to say code's the design. And this is something that actually tickles me personally because I, as I mentioned, I do a lot of formal verification, which is a design that's above the design of the code being the design. And this kind of shows actually why I really want to talk to a lot of different people. If I sort of talk to, say, just one person, I don't know whether or not his experiences between software and industry are universal. And if I only talk to people in one field, I don't know whether I'm figuring out whether software is different from engineering or software is different from just civil engineering. Because of course, civil engineering also has differences as does electrical, as does like chemical. They're all different from each other in different ways, but it doesn't make any of them not engineering. So yeah, and software is actually much more similar to traditional as I've started to call it trad engineering as uh, unlike what we say. That said, there are some differences. Not things that make us special, but things that make us different. By the way, I've now been talking 20 minutes. Has there been any questions brought up? This is also talking for you. No, okay. So there's a bunch of differences. The three I wanna talk about right now, the ones that I've basically got prepared. One is consistency. Software is much, 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 much more consistent than every other kind of engineering. What I mean by that is, okay, this function. Does anybody want to guess what this function does? I'll give you a hint. It's Python. Anybody from the audience? It's not a trick question. Does it sort the list? Yes, it sorts the list. Now, if you took this code and you downloaded it and you ran it, it would sort the list. Oh, I see that people are putting it in chat. Yeah. Um, I see some questions I'm going to answer at the end. Okay, it sorts the list. If I put it to another computer, it sorts the list. If I basically run it on a Game Boy that can run Python, it'll sort the list. Now, this is a resistor. These bands, this basically impedes the flow of electricity and is very important in circuitry. These bands tell us what kind of resistor it is. So this band, these two bands say that the base factor is 10, one, zero. This band is a million ohms. So this says that this is worth, this resistor is 10 million ohms in total, right? Now I see that I imagine that some of the people who actually have like worked with circuits are probably shaking their head because I forgot to mention this band. This is the gold band called the tolerance. And that band says that no, it's not actually 10, it's not actually 10 million ohms. It is somewhere between 9.5 and 10.5 million ohms. It can vary by up to 10% in total. And this is per resistor. If I have a hundred resistors, some of them will be 9.5, some of them will be 10.5, and everything else will be in between we don't have to deal with that at all in software. We don't have to deal with physical things being different, even if we have exact replicas of it. In fact, one person I talked to, um, a mechanical engineer in the UK said that they always dreaded switching manufacturers of parts because even if it was the parts the exact same spec, the slight differences would be enough to, to throw off everything and they'd have to restart so much of what the work they had to do to deal with the new manufacturer's parts. We don't have to deal with any of that and that's pretty great. Second one is velocity. And this is something that a lot of 
software people have brought up as a major difference that we can move so much faster. We can have our code changed in like seconds and deploy in seconds. And that is true. We can, we are much, much faster than every other field of engineering. The second fastest is probably chemical engineering. And the fastest there says like, yeah, if we really want to, we can sort of have changes done overnight. <laughs> now, this is actually interesting for a couple, for a few reasons. First of all, it's one of the reasons why we're a lot, why like we're able to sort of like choose to be more developer and less engineering because we can fix mistakes and iterate much faster. This is sort of one of the things that drives the difference in software culture. The, the negative flip side of that is that this often leads to people using the software to fix mistakes. They're like, oh, the software can iterate faster. If we have an issue in the hardware, we can just ignore it and let the software people deal with it. So like if say the chip doesn't quite have like if the chip essentially hardware has a bug, they can be like, well, we can fix it on the software layer. This is one of the reasons why the software, why the Boeing 737 Max was so problematic because they just tried to fix a hardware issue with software and didn't fix it with software properly. The third part that makes this interesting is that other fields of engineering really want this benefit. Moving faster is good. Being able to do, to basically iterate with less expense is good. And that's why a lot of engineering fields are adopting more tooling to essentially do simulations, to do things that would normally require them to basically build physical constructs or physical models, doing that entirely as simulation. Now, the final major difference I want to bring up is constraints. A constraint is very different in software than in hardware. And basically in software, like a constraint is something that we really don't want to violate for the most part, but it's okay if we do. It's okay if like the software takes 10 milliseconds longer, uses a bit too much memory. In some fields like real-time operating systems or avionics, this is not okay. Everything has to be hard real time. But for the most part, software people don't have to worry as much about numerical constraints. Whereas Again, with this mouse, if the circuit is maybe a couple centimeters too large, it doesn't fit in the mouse. So one of the big differences about traditional engineering is that constraints are much more strict. And that also leads to a lot of the different regulatory effects. It leads to a lot of the different, like a lot, like a lot more slowness. And again, helps us understand the actual differences between how traditional engineers do traditional engineering and software engineers do software engineering. And again, I want to reiterate, this isn't enough to say that we are distinct, that we are a different field entirely, but it is enough to basically say what makes us quirky compared to all the other fields. So the last thing I want to bring up really quick, the last topic that I asked people is what we can learn from each other. What we can take from traditional engineering and import into software and what we can export from software and traditional engineering. So I expected to get, so basically I heard a bunch of different ideas on the first way of like what we can derive from traditional engineering. And a couple of them were basically one, a, a, a greater sense of responsibility. People feel that they're more alienated from the customer as software people, partially because they can't physically hold the thing they're making. But the other thing that comes up a lot is the idea of requirements. In software, in software, it's sort of gauche to spend a lot of time gathering requirements and sort of working through like customer intentions without iterating first, without building something. Whereas in traditional engineering, this is done for a long time. People talk with clients and spend a lot of time figuring out what exactly people need. And a lot of people were kind of missed that. They're like, well, we don't want to be, we don't want to spend months figuring out requirements, but we also don't want to spend like zero time doing it either. Maybe like a week, two weeks, half a week to just not build anything and just figure out what we're building. And a lot of people thought that this would make a huge difference in really improving software. Now, the flip side, what can we export from our field into other fields? And this is where things get interesting to me because I was expecting to hear some partial answers and some like unique things, except that wasn't the case. Everybody listed one of two things. The first thing, almost every single person listed, version control. Sorry, I don't think that's big enough. Version control. Let's make it right. Okay, yes, version control. Version control is the single biggest, most radical innovation that software engineering has developed that could radically change pretty much every other field of human intelligence work, knowledge work. The ability to be able to say, okay, Figure out the difference between the version of the code Gary was working on six months ago 
and the version running on this server in production and bisect both of those things to figure out where the bug starts is unheard of in any other field. People would be talking about, yeah, we'd be mailing like zip files around to each other, or we'd only have one physical copy that could never leave our site. Version control, I cannot emphasize enough how important this innovation is. The other thing that actually was really interesting that's a bit less kind of, that I'm a little bit less histrionic about, hysterically, like in, in favor of is um, open conferences. The fact that right now I am talking to 70 people about something that isn't academia and not a trade show, I am not trying to pitch you something, is pretty much unheard of. The idea of conferences where there are thousands of people who show up who aren't showing up because their employers sent them to like figure out what the vendors are selling this time, but because there are talks on the cutting edge of software like innovation and software engineering doesn't appear in any other field of engineering. And people wish they had that. They wish that they could just log into Stack Overflow and ask a bunch of like complicated electrical engineering questions. I mean, there's an electrical engineering Stack Overflow, but not nearly to the same scope and like level of acceptance that that like the software one is. People miss the idea of having open source, being able to just take stuff apart, be, seeing blog posts where it's just somebody's like, hey, I want to share this knowledge with you. That is something that we just don't really see outside of software. And it's again, something that we can radically like use to improve other fields. The way I sort of jokingly referred to it is that traditional engineering is very good at making great products with kind of terrible processes, while we're good at making kind of terrible on products with great processes. So in conclusion, we're engineers, sort of, I'm nuanced there. We're not special and there's a lot we can teach and learn. I'm not really done with this project just yet. Um, there's still a lot I want to do with it. First of all, I want to do more interviews, like just to fill out some like lacks. Like I haven't gotten a chance to really talk to an industrial engineer yet or like a full on process engineer. I need to do a full write up. Um, the first draft of this talk was about 6,000 words. I imagine a full write will probably be closer to 10 to 12,000 because I also talk about a lot of stuff I can't talk about here. And I also really want to start interviewing things outside of like engineering because I'm a person who firmly believes that like every field has stuff that we can teach and learn from each other. And I like, I'm sure at least some of you have heard my rants about how amazing library science is and how much we can learn from librarians. So I'd love to do things like interview therapists, journalists, like people who have a lot of experience in different knowledge fields and sort of get more interdisciplinary conversation going on. So in conclusion, um, I recently announced a new TLA Plus workshop. If you go to my site, hillwing.com, you can see it and register there. Um, and that's pretty much all I had frantically prepared at the last second. So I'm now happy to answer any questions and do discussion with people.